morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you are. And uh, welcome to everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today for this webinar. My name is Nicholas Meinig. I am a researcher at the International Food Policy Research Institute, IFPRI, and I'll be moderating the webinar today. Um, as you probably know, uh, the title of the presentation is Pathways, Challenges, and Opportunities for Digital Technology in Global Value Chains, the Case of Coffee in Central America. Uh, it will be presented by Jenny Mello uh, from the University of Missouri, uh, also affiliated with the Alliance for Biodiversity and SIA. Uh, to set the stage for today's presentation, we have some introductory comments from Rob Vos. Rob is the director of the Markets, Trade, and Institutions Division at IFPRI, uh, and he's also the head of the CGR initiative on rethinking food markets uh, for inclusive and sustainable value chains. Uh, unfortunately, he couldn't be with us uh, live um, because he's in India attending the G20 agricultural meeting. Um, However, uh, he did uh, take the time to provide some comments in a video recording. And so uh, just to say uh, four or five minutes of introductory comments to sort of set the stage for um, understanding why we're interested in digital technologies and uh, what the potential uh, for these technologies is in improving agricultural markets and, uh, and, and agricultural production. Okay, so I guess we can um, start the video uh, of Rob Vos. Um, Buenos dias, good morning, afternoon or evening from wherever you're connecting to this webinar. Welcome. We are very happy to see so many of you taking interest in this webinar. In this webinar, we want to obtain a better understanding of the different digital technologies available for the coffee value chain in Central America. Specifically, we want to know how these digital innovations can be deployed and adapted such that especially smallholder coffee growers and small and medium sized businesses operating in the coffee value chain and related services can reap the benefits from these innovations through better market access, incomes and employment. We further want to discuss how such benefits can be extended throughout the coffee sector once scaled up. The digital revolution in food systems is a hot topic. At the G20 Agriculture Ministerial Meeting in India, where I am at the moment, it is one of the four priorities on the agenda. While its importance is clear, how to steer these new technologies to benefit not just the efficiency of food value chains, but also how to ensure all food system actors are able to access those technologies and share in the gains, those are still big question marks. At the G20 Agriculture Ministerial meeting, much of the focus is on digital technologies that can help improve farm productivity, including through use of robotics, GPS technologies to optimize fertilizer application, and so on. However, much is also changing along supply chains, where e-platforms for logistics finance, commercialization, and market information are changing how food <clears throat> systems and food products are distributed, transported, and financed, and how markets can be accessed. Digital innovations are also facilitating product quality tracing, and important in, it is very important for regulation of food standards. All of these innovations can have positive impacts by increasing productivity, more efficient use of fertilizer and pesticides, reducing production costs, and improved market access, as well as tracing food quality and or application of sustainable practices. But there are also risks and possible downsides. Not everyone has access to broadband internet to access these tools, and the concentration of knowledge uh, or, the owner, or the concentration of ownership of the related know-how could further empower large market players and exclude smallholders and small and medium enterprises from the gains. At this webinar, Jenny Melo will present the findings of a scoping study of the challenges and opportunities that digital innovations can bring to the coffee sector in Central America. The study is part of the CGIR research in initiative on rethinking food markets and value chains for inclusion and sustainability. 
that we launched uh, last year. As you will hear from Jenny, the study reviewed 23 digital technologies, including for digitized market linkages to promote traceability throughout the coffee chain, digital advisory extension technologies to deliver data on weather and crop diseases, digitized farm tools to facilitate information management and digital financial services. While all have potential, many actors in Honduras and Guatemala face face enormous challenges to access these in part because of deficiencies in the digital infrastructure and the cost of these technologies. Most of these technologies are close to market readiness, but few are developed in direct engagement with association of coffee producers or traders. So a key question is whether the benefits will be spread equally. As said, such challenges as much as the opportunities are precisely what this webinar is all about. Your insights will be very valuable as much as important for the future of the coffee sector in Central America. So I very much look forward to a lively discussion with the active engagement from all of you. Let me close by saying that this webinar is organized through the new knowledge platform for inclusive and sustainable markets and value chains, KISM. This new platform not only serves to engage with you through webinars like this, but is providing a wealth of evidence on food system related topics like these. It also has an online discussion forum for which you can engage in follow up discussions after this seminar. I wish you a very successful webinar and apologies again for not being able to be live with you. Great. Um, so uh, Rob uh, Vos has given a brief overview of the topic, um, and he's explained why there's a lot of interest in digital technologies for agricultural production and marketing, and very high expectations. Um, but he's also touched on some of the limitations, some of the challenges in getting this technology to uh, a, a large number of people, uh, particularly low-income farmers. Um, as he mentioned, it is one of the four main themes of the G20 agricultural meeting taking place as we speak in New Delhi this week. Um, before we start uh, the webinar, before we start the presentation, I'd like to take a few minutes to provide uh, a little bit of context for the study. Uh, I'd like to describe the agenda and then make a few housekeeping announcements. Um, so this study was carried out under the CGR initiative, whose full name is Rethinking Food Markets for Inclusive and Sustainable Value Chains. Uh, sometimes we just say Rethinking uh, Food Markets. Um, this is a collaborative research program uh, led by IFPRI in collaboration with six other CGIR uh, centers. Um, that includes Alliance uh, for Biodiversity and SIOT, uh, CIMIT, IITA, ICARDA, World Fish, um, and so on. So uh, the, the goal is to identify and test promising interventions uh, to improve the efficiency, the sustain, sustainability, and inclusiveness of uh, food markets. Uh, the initiative is organized into four components. Uh, the first one focusing on global food value chains, the second on uh, domestic food value chains, a third one on cross-cutting services such as finance and logistics, uh, and then the third one focuses on sort of macro analysis and includes the knowledge platform for inclusive and sustainable food markets, uh, which uh, goes by KISM, K-I-S-M. Um, so the first component focusing on global, global value chains um, includes four country case studies. And one of these studies is coffee in Honduras. Um, the study is led by the Alliance for Biodiversity and SIAD. Um, and if you're interested in more information, we have links to the Rethinking Markets Initiative uh, in the chat and also to uh, KISM, um, which is one component of the initiative. Okay, let's uh, quickly go over the agenda. Uh, as you know, the topic today is Pathways, Challenges, and Opportunities for Digital Technology and Global Value Chains, the Case of Coffee in Central America. It will be presented by Jenny Mello, who is a rural sociologist at the Center 
for Regenerative Agriculture at the University of Missouri. Uh, Jenny is also a visiting researcher uh, at the uh, Alliance for Bioversity and SIA and co-founder of Weya Delta. Um, after her presentation, we are very fortunate to have two experts in the field as discussants. Uh, the first is Andrea Gardea Sabal uh, Monsalve, who is the Monitoring, Evaluation, and Learning Manager at the International Maize and Wheat Improvement Center, uh, well known by its Spanish acronym, SUIN. Um, the second discussant is Nestor Javier Meneses Chacon, who is the Deputy Technical Manager at the Instituto Hondureño del Café, the uh, Honduran Institute of Coffee. Um, after the, after the discussants make their comments, there will be a question and answer period, uh, which is an opportunity for you uh, to ask questions or make comments, uh, either to the presenters or the discussants or to, <laughs> to everybody uh, overall. Finally, let me just uh, note a few uh, housekeeping points. Uh, first, this session is being recorded. If you or someone you know is interested in seeing the video, it will be posted on the KISM website uh, within two weeks or so. Um, second, if you have any questions, please use the question and answer chat box. Uh, you can post questions at any time. It's not necessary to wait until the end of the presentation. Also, when you do post a question, please indicate your name, affiliation, and who the question is for. Is it for Jenny or one of the discussants or uh, or maybe just a, a general question. Um, third, if you're having te technical difficulties, uh, please contact uh, Ms. Geram Tesfaye in the chat box. She is more likely to see you if you tag her with the at symbol and then her name, uh, T-E-S-F-A-Y-E. -E. Uh, finally, the fourth uh, point, um, if you prefer, you can listen to the Spanish version. Um, busque el icono del de mundo en el parte abajo de la pantalla de Zoom, haga clic y seleccione el idioma que desea. Claro que la única opción es el español. Uh, and now we can move on to the presentation. So I will um, pass the virtual microphone to Jenny Mello. Um, over to you, Jenny. Thank you very much. Nicholas, for this introduction and presentation, let me share uh, my screen. And we can verify that everything is OK. You can see it now? Yes. OK. Well, set my time. Um, I'm very happy for being here and having this possibility to talk about this emerging and fascinating topic that I think we all need to, to learn more and to have a better idea uh, with the aim to, to be, you know, we'd be able to shape the trajectories of these technologies. So in, my, in this 20 minutes presentation, I would like to talk about three main elements. The first, I'm going to share some conceptual elements and some ideas so we all have a common ground of the elements to address these kind of technologies. Later, I'm going to talk about some elements of the context uh, in Guatemala and Honduras. And in the last part, I'm going to share the, the results of, of this uh, mapping that we conducted last year. So starting, um, as I say, I, I would like to share five ideas that I think are important. Uh, so we all have this common understanding and we all have some elements and some questions to ask to these new technologies. So the first thing I would like to share is that this sector is not mo monolithic. It comprises different layers of technological sophistication. So uh, we are talking about digital tools that are tools that collect, store, analyze, and share information um, digitally, including mobile phones and internet. So sometimes we, we can have the, the temptation to think, only about like you know the groundbreaking technologies or artificial intelligence or blockchain or machine learning, but in but in reality we are seeing in the field, you know several digital tools combining. So we can see in the field 
since you know low tech from WhatsApp groups, sharing information, but also more sophisticated information. So, uh, and and sophisticated kind of technologies. So when we are talking about this sector, we are talking um, to a broader spectrum of possibilities, of a broader spectrum of digital tools, including like low tech and high high tech, all you know across the value chain. So we are seeing elements. You know, for drones and sensors that are used, uh, that are more used on on the farm, but also other kind of digital tools that are used in different parts, more for the market part of of the consuming the food. So that's the first thing. There is a, this is a big umbrella, and different um, layers of technological sophistications are within. Uh, the second element is that when we talk about these technologies, the term is too broad, it's too, it's too big. So the, the, the second element is that the, we can analyze these, these digital technologies through the type of service it offers to the, to the value chain, to the kind of service it offers to different actors, in this case, farmers. So here is a, is a, a plethora of five possibilities. Um, that help us to see in more detail these technologies. The first is advisory and extension. And the idea of these digital tools is to offer information so, so farmers can improve decision-making about their crops, about their produce, and e everything that is related to that part of the decision made by the farmer. But also there are another groups more related to the farm tools. So, there are all these kind of devices helping to gather uh, farm information. And the goal of this is to facilitate the collection synthesis and interpretation of farm data. So here we are talking about sensors, drones, all, all these kind of devices gathering farm in information. A third group, it's uh, these technologies more in the sense of financial services. So these kind of uh, digital tools are providing the farmers the possibility to access different financial services. Other groups are digital tools connected with market linkages. So we, we can see here marketplaces, e-commerce, and different um, services that aim to facilitate the farmer's access you know, to, trans to transactional interactions. And also, but, but really connected with this, is the supply chain management. So here we can find different uh, technologies of offering solutions across the value chain. So some more technologies connected with traceability, for example. So with this, we, we can see uh, you know, a large group of technologies. And, they, and my main idea here is that we can have these groups we can identify these groups. And when we do the analysis, we can talk about the specificity of, of each one of these groups. Uh, another element, you know, a third element here, that I think is very important, is connecting with, with the data. When we talk about you know, this digital economy, the data is the blood of this economy. So data is very important. And for sure, I think that we all, we all have, have heard you know, many, debates about how is this data being used. So it is important you know, to talk about the data, but also to talk about the data in a specific way and to understand that not all the data is equal and the challenges are not the same. So these challenges and opportunities, they vary across the type of service we are talking. So I, I really like this, um, this graphic from, from Godan and uh, GFAR because it helps us to see the different streams of data. So we can have localized data. So this is information that is gathered on the farm. So this inf information about soil data, seed use, water use on farm. So we can envision some drones or sensors or robotics on farm capturing this information. Uh, and in this particular uh, group of information, the main challenges are connected with privacy, with ownership, with, with who is making money of this information. In other group, we have this imported data. So we have this information that uh, talk about weather, about price, about market. So this is information that um, is being provided to farmers, for example, different apps or, or different WhatsApp groups. 
And the, and the challenge here is not the privacy or the ownership. The, 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 the aspect here is the availability, the accessibility. And also, you know, there are other kinds of data, this exported data that is this use, that is this inf information uh, compiled on farm to be used off farm, and this ancillary data that um, is other kind of data, for example, governmental statistics or research data on agriculture. So here it's a topic about specificity. And another element is that we are all seeing an, op an optimism behind this, uh, you know, the use of these technologies. And the for me, the main point here is that this optimism is just an assumption that we need to ask more questions. We need to conduct more research to know if this path, this expected path of more technology, it's equal to more efficiency and to a lower transaction cost. And in consequence, more equity and, and more efficiency if this path is true or under which conditions or for, or for whom. So that's an important element. And finally, uh, two uh, elements to consider here is that we have to ask the right questions. And for that, we need to organize the conversation. So the first thing is that I think we, we need to consider who is included and who is not when we are deploying these technologies. So some elements to consider uh, in this part is that there are gaps in access, of course, the infrastructure that we all know, but there are other elements that we have to consider, the gender gap, the data gap, the generational gap, and other gaps in capabilities, motivations, and opportunities. So we can have with this, you know, uh, this structural view about these uh, elements that are provided by the, uh, by the but external, but also these individual capacities, this mindset to use these technologies. So all these factors we have to pay attention to in order to promote these technologies. But also we need, um, we need to think in other factors. When we are, are, are already you know, working with the technology, we need to ask who governs these technologies and how. So that's a different conversation about data, the challenges, but also the business models behind each one of these services, because each one of these business models offer different possibilities, but also brings different challenges. So with this, these uh, some elements, so we all have uh, common ground to talk about this. So later, as I was saying, um, I would like to offer some brief elements about the context in Honduras and Guatemala, so we can have this, this idea of in which context we are seeing this mapping. So first, um, I'm sorry. So yeah, first, this is important to know, you know, this is the general situation of Central America. This is, is, the, this is the agricultural digitalization index by the World Bank. This is a measure that, that pay attention to the availability. So it estimates the share of farmland in a country with mobile coverage, but also the affordability, which means the availability of mobile services and devices at price points uh, in each place. And this non-digital environment, so all other non-digital enables and market capacity. So we, we can see the different, uh, the different situation of each country. And I think this, um, this graphic is important because make us think that it is not only you know, to have more access to internet. There are other aspects that we have to consider in terms of availability and affordability and the other, and the other um, aspects that have to be, that has to be in place so we can unfold you know, a digital technology strategy for agriculture. And here there are another two elements in, in the same line. This is, um, this is the score of the uh, ICT regulatory tracker for, for Guatemala. This is a measure by the International Telecommun Telecommunication Unit. And it shows the, the change in the ICT regulatory environment and it takes uh, it pays attention to regulatory authority mandates regime and competition framework so in guatemala there are like advancing and the the question there now is how to open the the markets and what are the implications for that 
But on the other hand, in Honduras, they are not in that, you know, in that situation, the, the, the situation there. It's more how to stimulate like the competition in a market that is already open. So these elements are important to think in the context and to think in these enables that uh, will allow that this sector will flourish. And finally, some elements that uh, we found from secondary information is that in, for example, in, in Honduras, a recent is a study found that the main three actors are agribusinesses, technology companies, and international agencies working there, that their topic uh, or their focus are more in advisory services. And in general, this is, uh, they found that this sector is very emergent, it's very new. So with all this context, I would like to share the, the results of, of this mapping. So we did a mapping last year, and that it's, uh, those are the results that I'm, I'm going to share. So we did a mapping last year. This mapping was conducted between October and December. And we, um, we pay attention to different layers of complexity. So I, we, we create these four categories. We conduct some, some interviews, more informative interviews. It was a mapping conducted mainly through secondary in, information. It is not a not exhaustive mapping, but uh, it think, we think that it offers enough illustration about what is happening in, in this sector. So, uh, we put together these four categories in these digital market linkages. I put together the market and the, you know, the traceability and the management along the value chain. And what, what we found, we found uh, different kind of technologies. So those um, with, the, with the flag are those that are like raised and being developed in the country or with operations there. And the other are, other technologies being used with potential use in Central America or good practices that can be considered for the case of Central America. So that is the situation of this mapping. And you can see we found different situations in terms of how, how much ready they are. So we have you know, this from the prototype to the in the mature market, and they are like all over there. This, these technologies being developed by, you know, by actors in the country that are in the sense, I mean, they are in a scale mainly in prototype and a scaling that are there and other more international uh, technologies and services that are more in the mature um, situation. Uh, here is only the view for these technologies developed in Central America on recurrent operations there. Um, and we can see, you know, that this, this, um, the situation it changed depending if it's more advisory or farm tools or market linkages. But it is, uh, it's we cannot see a, like a common pattern. We we, we can see they are advancing at different uh, paces. Another important thing is what kind of actors are behind these technologies. So one important thing is that we found that development organizations working with private companies are one of the relevant promoters of these technologies across the different groups. So we have you know, different agency of developmental projects working across these different categories. And also we see the, the enter of startups and medium companies entering into this, 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 um, this sector. And I think to have this panorama it's really important so, so we can see the actors that are, that are there, the strategies of partnership that is being deployed to work in this sector. And this also tell about the, you know, the, all the requirement, all the hard work, all the investment that has to be put in place to develop these uh, digital technologies. So now I'm going to offer briefly some examples of what, what what we found in this mapping that you all can see in the uh, PDF that it, it was in the page uh, of this uh, webinar. So some of the uh, technologies offer this uh, weather in information uh, with in different formats or web-based or through an app. Uh, there are more focus on delivering data on weather or crop diseases with the idea, as I said at the beginning, to inform better decision-making. 
but also there are other farming tools. These are, this is, uh, it exists more, uh, this, this is a product from Brazil, but it has the possibility to be used uh, abroad. And it has this more nuance, um, uh, it offers more nuance and more deep information about the, the crops in, in particular. There are other tools that are more connected to, to gather information and to put it in an organized way. So this is one trend and the other is these tools that are, are being capturing like actual information for the seed, for the grains and to support in different decision making. Other are different financial services. We found like very few uh, in Central America, but there are some, for example, this is Micaja in Honduras. And this is an example of what kind of uh, interface farmers can see. But this is only, you know, to, to see the savings or to ask for a loan or to do different transactions. But in Colombia, for example, there is a, a good practice uh, about how to offer finance to farmers and what means can be put in place so the farmers can have access to different resources. So in the same topic, we, we are seeing different possibilities of different business models, of different emphasis. And finally, we have this connection with the market. And here, uh, you know, we have marketplaces and e-commerce, but I think, I think now in the context of the new legislation to, uh, to require this traceability for farmers, we talk about, you know, to talking about traceability is very important. So here, the, an example of two platforms that exist. This is in a trace that is being in, 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 that is in development in this moment. And this is IBM Food Trust. These two aim to do the same through, through different means. And the idea is to offer this traceability of payment across the value chain. All these are in a pilot stage. I mean, there are in this moment in which we are done knowing very much what is the future of this or how this is going to unfold. So now here we, I offer a general description about what technologies are, are available. But the, but the most important question is how these technologies, how this offer meets the bottlenecks of the coffee value chain in Honduras. And this is a um, graphic from a uh, scoping that my colleagues in, in Honduras did the last year uh, about what are these uh, bottlenecks um, in this value chain. Uh, they have these three, they, they um, identify these three problems. One is related more with the role of intermediaries in the chain and how, um, and how these, these forward asymmetries create other consequences uh, in the value chain. Uh, for example, the low, uh, the low the low profit, which uh, translates into low, low incomes, uh, and also it implies there are not many uh, investment in the quality. So we enter this mapping through the uh, through the door of ICT, the, through the door of technology. But the most important thing I, I believe is to do this 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 dialogue between how the offer is containing or not the 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 current flow. The, the current bottlenecks and aspects to improve within this value chain. And in Honduras, my colleagues uh, in SIAT, they are working with practitioners there to, to create a uh, pilot and to, and to develop these um, potential technologies to address these bottlenecks. So with this, uh, I would like to say thank you for your time and open the, the floor for the discussions. Thank you very much. Great. Uh, thank you so much, Jenny. That was really uh, comprehensive. Uh, you covered quite a lot of material very concisely and uh, comprehensively. Um, I really enjoyed the, the classification of the different types of services, both by what services they provide and where the information comes from, who is the, the audience for it. Um, you also talked about governance and uh, the uh, you know sort of uh, discussion of the 23 different types of uh, digital services that are currently either being tested or used in, uh, in Honduras. Um, very interesting stuff and um, really a lot of food for thought. Um, but 
Uh, let me uh, now pass uh, the virtual microphone to uh, Andrea. Uh, just a little bit more uh, background. Um, she has an MSc in Information and Communication Technology for Development from the University of Manchester in the UK and a master's in political science from the Universidad de los Andes in Bogota. Um, she has more than 13 years researching digital innovations for ag food systems and coordinating complex development projects in food security, sustainable agriculture, uh, and education. As I mentioned, she uh, is uh, working at the uh, CIMIT. So, uh, Andrea, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Nicholas. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen briefly. Please let me know if you can see it well. And um, I'll keep it brief to probably share some of the experiences we've had. Um, and thank you, Jenny, for that presentation because you have brought up many of the ideas and challenges we, we already have. Um, my personal experience and from Summit side um, is not gonna be focused in spe specifically on coffee, but it's really, really related and very close, closely related to the whole challenge around the value chains and how to use um, digital solutions for that. So the way we have been calling this is data-driven solutions for smart agri-food systems, meaning we have the value chains happening here and there, complex systems around agriculture, and we need to understand how do we take the best picture of it using the new technologies that we have available, but also taking care of privacy, taking care of data quality, taking care of um, the digital skills that we have in place. So how do we take the, the best picture that we can is the first step. So that's what we call data collection. And from there, um, for that data to become information, we um, conduct some cleaning and integration processes. I've, I've read some comments in the chat already asking about, okay, so how do you integrate all the solutions and you know to operate at the system level? So that's something we have been trying to address as well. And for that information to become knowledge, we understand that integrated data and that integrated services um, need to be analyzed. Then for that knowledge to become action, we believe there, need, there needs to be an integration of these analysis into visualization tools and decision support systems tools, not only for farmers, but all the stakeholders along the value chain. And finally, we believe there is a need to do monitoring, evaluation, and learning of this whole process of data-driven solutions to understand what the impact of digital innovation and the impact of our interventions in the field is. So basically what we have been doing in the sense is to collect data, we collect ground truth data from farmers. So we have several applications and several services around to collect ground truth data. Also crowdsourcing is very important because we have for many of the apps that we have available, especially in Central America, they require very high skills to operate a mobile phone to collect their own data. So getting ground truth data, it's an actual challenge already, as we all know. It is important to understand what are the skills of the farmers that we're working in with and what are and how we can help them. So some of them um, collect data through extension agents, but others um, can be done directly to the farmer, but mainly um, so in some cases it's useful to make a call, some cases it's useful to use WhatsApp instead of using apps, asking them to collect the data. We also collect other data, remote sensing, public, public sources, and weather data and other satellite imagery. Um, I'm gonna just leave here some of the, some of the results we had had in the last eight years of work. Um, then for information integration and to clean that data, we have processes, automatic processes, because at the moment we identify, we have a lot of data collected, but we are not really um, knowing how to use that data because we cannot integrate it. It's not standardized, it's not cleaned. It takes a lot of time to understand what type of data that we have. So we have worked on processes automat that automatically work to clean, for instance, yield or clean, depending on the crop and on the production system, clean the variables based on that. Then on the analysis, we have different types of analysis. So normally we tend to think that analysis means AI already or machine learning or very complex models, but it's not necessarily like that. Sometimes we do descriptive analytics that are already very useful for the farmers. So for instance, the cost benefit analysis per plot is already something very interesting, but also comparing farmers that are have similar conditions around themselves and sharing that information among them is very useful as well. 
Then for the action, as I said, we have decision support systems, we have built dashboards, we have built um, that we do a lot of podcasts to be shared through WhatsApp or other types of WhatsApp messages. We also have a data wallet to start piloting that we have started piloted to offer the farmers the ownership of the data so they can actually have not only what you were talking about, Jenny, the, the wallet where they, where they have access to finance, um, to finance assistant, but also data wallet where they can collect their data, save the data and decide what they do with it um, as an asset. And finally, we have the monitoring and evaluation processes. We are trying to understand um, what we do. So just to, to end this short comment, I would like to, to identify four or five main approaches that we have learned over the years. First is user, final user needs to be at the center. We need to understand how the user interacts with technology. What do they need? Um, how do they work? What do they reject? <laughs> what, is that, what is it really that they don't like? Um, and we need to co-design with them. That's very, very important. Data privacy is key. So they, farmers are the owners of the data and they deserve to keep that ownership. And we need to reinforce and design processes and systems for that. Open source community software and languages are the ones that work best for us in our countries, in our contexts, having no, not, not to pay for a license or having continuous development around the community for these technologies is very, very important as well. Um, also having robust plus low cost technologies. So I bet we all know ODK and that's the best example of a robust and low cost technology. It operates very well, it operates offline. We don't need connectivity. It's very easy to use, anyone can use it. You don't need to pay anything for it. So that type of technologies are the ones that we are reinforcing the most. And then finally, training and long-term support for final users is very, very key. From our end, not only expecting the software providers to do that, but from our end as brokers of the technology. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much for listening. Great. Thank you so much, Andrea. It's really uh, interesting to see the range of uh, activities that, that Simit is working on. And you, you can already see, you know, sort of overlaps between the classification system that that Jenny was talking about, and the types of work that um, the the whole range of work that uh, uh, that Simit is is working on or or collaborating on, um, I think it's really interesting, a very useful point of the sort of uh, lessons learned at at the end, and in particular the one about uh, focusing on the user needs and experiences, because you know if if the user um, can't use it or doesn't find it useful, then the whole thing collapses no matter how good your technology and your programming is on, on, the, on the backside. Um, okay, let's uh, move on. And um, now we'll uh, hear some comments from uh, Nestor. Um, he received a master's in quality management. I hope I'm translating that correctly uh, from the Universidad El Zamorano. Uh, and has 20 years of professional experience, including 16 working on coffee. Uh, he has worked at the Instituto Hondureño del Café on GIS analysis, coordinating the uh, program called Tasa de Excelencia, uh, excellent cup. I guess that's uh, you know tasting, uh, improving flavor, uh, and is currently the uh, deputy technical director guiding the planning strategic alliances and all the technical departments at the Institute. Uh, so Nestor, uh, the microphone is yours. Thank you, Nick. Uh, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Nestor Meneses, technical department manager of Honduran Coffee Institute. And it is a great pleasure for me um, to be part of this forum for the exchange of experience of regarding technological innovation in the coffee sector in Honduras. Um, as you can see, uh, so it's a broad topic. So I will try to summarize the situation of the technological innovation in Honduran coffee industry. Um, for this, I believe it's uh, very important to quickly explain how the industry in Honduras is composed and the interactions uh, that exist among the different actors, the needs for the innovation they have and uh, or the technologies for each uh, of them. 
and the current offerings, uh, the technology that it have, they have and the segment they are focused on, as well as the limitations or gaps that we currently face in terms of the edges to the, the digital technology by different actors in the uh, our industry in coffee in Honduras. Um, the coffee industry in Honduras is composed by nearly 100,000 producers, or more precisely, producing families, over than uh, 700 intermediaries, and around 100 exporters. Uh, but talking about the producers, 92% uh, of them have less than three uh, hectares of coffee. It means they are very, very small farmers. 7% of farmers have between three and 15 hectares, and only 1% of them are considered large farmers with more than 15 hectares of coffee. Uh, for this large segment of small farmers, mostly with the, of them with low levels of education, uh, naturally has are resistant to adopting technological tools which makes the usage difficult and slow. It's a process very difficult and slow. Another fact, factor that affects uh, all farmers is um, the farm side. Uh, as I said, 92% um, of them are slow. But regardless, the farm side uh, is the low internet connectivity or another factor we are facing. In many uh, production areas, as you know, Honduras is uh, the, the, the coffee production areas is in the mountains. So we, we have a very bad connection for uh, internet. Uh, this hand, uh, but uh, this problem has, um, has improved significantly in the past five years. Uh, we, are, we have better and better connection but uh, it's still a, a limitation for uh, the farmers. Finally, we must consider that over than 50% of the uh, coffee producers in Honduras are over 50 years old. Uh, uh, it means we have a very old farmers and the age factor certain, certainly affect their capacity to adopt in new technologies. And we know that uh, younger individuals or younger people are more innovative and has quickly adaptation for the new technologies than the older uh, old people. Uh, analysis by type of service, uh, as Jenny said in, in mentioning his in her presentation, in terms of technical assistance and extension, a uh, few tools have been developed in this regard. Uh, at eCafe, we use tools like ODKs on another like Google Forms or uh, Monkey Survey and others to collect data and track technical assistance activities. Uh, we, are, we connect all this data uh, with uh, a Power BI to analyze the information. But we are developing an exclusive platform in this moment for this purpose with uh, the support of the US AID project uh, called Forms. In this moment, we are in the developing stage for this platform. We also have an, an early warming system for water, pets, and disease that we have uh, not yet completely digitized this platform. And we need to make it available to producers in a user-friendly format um, for now, this is our pending task. We have to work how to uh, share this information in a friend, user friendly format with our, our farmers. In the case of farm management tools, there are many available, and the ones that are available are not intuitive enough to assist producers, given the limitation I mentioned before. Uh, at this moment, we talk uh, with two companies that create support platforms for producers. Uh, the first one is uh, Bayer. We, Bayer have a um, system and platform called CultiBot, which uh, works in, in WhatsApp platform. So it's very friendly for farmers. Farmers, uh, mostly of them, are very familiarizing um, 
WhatsApp platform. The other one is called Climatica, uh, which is an application for mobile, but both are very general tools for a wide range of crops. So we need to work on adapting them, especially to uh, coffee cultivation, do the, the, the situation in Honduras and adding topics that are not currently covered. In financial services, we have seen more and more producers embracing digital banking over the past few years, five years. Uh, but there's a still a long way to go in, especially regarding access to credit and monitor and a compliance with credit requirements of these uh, farmers to um, get more, more um, access to, to bank or uh, credit um, funds. Commerce is one of the processes that requires most support in the coffee value chain in Honduras. Regarding domestic trade, there are no digital, digital registration system for commercial transactions. Uh, Honduran Coffee Institute has a trust program where uh, $9 per quintal of green coffee market is retained from, from the farmers, the producers. Uh, the intermediaries and exporters who finally export this coffee have to, export, to report the sales uh, to uh, Honduran Coffee Institute, and the money is only re returned to the farmers or are applied to financial obligations guaranteed by the trust program after the information is verified uh, by, for the producer and the exporter. The downside is that the, uh, because it is an, an analog process, it takes too long and this causes this, this dissatisfaction among uh, producers. Uh, for international trade, there are platforms for coffee sales, but they are not as popular since 70% of coffee in Honduras is sold by intermediaries rather than exporters or roasters. But on the other hand, there are also platforms available to producers and cooperatives for online trading. And many farmers are already selling roast and ground coffee through these platforms, mostly in the national market. Lastly, in terms of digital services for value chain management, many platforms have emerged uh, to assist exporters and cooperatives in the traceability of their, operation, of, uh, of their operations, incorporating data and information from farm management, processing, quality control, and marketing, whether at national or international level. And there are also some examples, good examples of blockchain adoption in the marketing process in certain cooperatives in the Western of the country. So, uh, that's my participation. I hope that I have effectively conveyed the various digital technologies initiatives that are emerging in the coffee sector in Honduras. Thank you, and uh, I'm open to any questions or comments you may have. Great. Uh, well, thank you, Nasser. I think that was a really nice example of you know um, all the different ways in which uh, these technologies can be applied to a specific sector, to coffee in Honduras. And I was particularly interested in your point that um, although sometimes these platforms exist, you know, maybe in some kind of generic form, they still need to be adapted for the particular issues that you have with coffee as a tree crop or uh, the situation in Honduras, let's say, with um, you know, not everybody having uh, good um, uh, access to uh, wireless signal and so on. Um, so thank you again, Nestor, uh, really uh, excellent. I think it, it complements uh, uh, the other, um, the, the original presentation and the uh, comments by, um, by Andrea. Uh, so now we have um, about 15 or 20 minutes to uh, go over some of the question. Um, we have um, already probably more questions than uh, then can be addressed, but um, let's get started on these. Um, so I will try to group these together. There are two different people, um, Dariel uh, Diaz Alvarez uh, and uh, Gabriel Metz asked similar questions. Um, 
And they both commented that there are a lot of different types of solutions. Uh, I guess this question is for Jenny, but if uh, Andrea or Nestor wants to, uh, uh, to provide a comment, that's fine too. Um, there are many different um, companies and projects and initiatives, um, but they probably, or they don't seem to be connected. They're not linked or interoperable. Um, and uh, the question is, would it be better to focus efforts on having a single system that would integrate all of these different services, market information, you know, making links between buyers and sellers early, uh, alert warnings for weather and things like that? Um, or is this just uh, sort of part of the process of figuring out what works best and then um, you know, sort of strengthening that. So, so the question is, with all these different initiatives, um, wouldn't it be better to integrate them, or is the current system, uh, you know, uh, uh, good? Good. I, <laughs> um, I think they expressed it better in, in Spanish than my translation. But uh, go ahead, Jen. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yes, I think that. The sector now, I mean, in coffee and in many other uh, agricultural products, the sector is so emerging, is so new. We are seeing this, this growing of different endeavors, initiatives, and projects. And one thing that we can thought is like, maybe we need all this integration, but I'm not sure. I, I think maybe the decision is, has to be tied to the structure of each value chain and thinking about the needs of each value chain. And also thinking, who are the actors that are going to benefit the most from this articulation? I mean, maybe we can think that, oh, this articulation can bring more efficiency, but I don't know if this efficiency, I mean, this goal for efficiency is going to work in the same, you know, with different value chain structures. So I, um, I think that um, we need more research, we need more work, we need more dialogues about this. We need a better understanding of what is actually happening, how this offer is growing, and to where is to where is leading to and, and to do this connection with how this articulation can or cannot solve the, you know, or address the problems of each value chain. So uh, so to answer, I think that's a question that that we have to, uh, you know, the actors in each value chain have to solve together because in, I think in this sector, the, uh, the, the approaches need to be different and need to be tailored to the specific, you know, the asymmetries, the interest and the distribution of different actors across value chain and always asking who is going to benefit from this articulation, what actors are going to take the most and what actors are going to be excluded for any kind of decision like this. Uh, great. Thanks, Jenny. Um, so, you know, I think part of the answer is we don't know uh, what is the best system, so it's hard to standardize yet. And uh, part of another part of the answer is that there are different needs for different farmers. Uh, and so, uh, you know, what works for one type of farmer or one crop won't necessarily work for another. Um, a related question, uh, this was actually Gabriel Metz's question was about coffee and uh, cacao. You know, why uh, is it necessary to have separate systems for the two different crops, given that often farmers are, are growing both, uh, maybe the coffee on the highlands and, and uh, uh, cocoa in, in, in the low areas. Um, maybe, uh, Nestor, could you, uh, since you made that comment about tailoring these two coffee are there opportunities for combining, let's say, coffee and cocoa uh, together, or are they different enough that they really need different, uh, different apps, different um, services? Uh, that's a good question. We tried in the past uh, combine cacao and coffee in, uh, with uh, some parts of our farmers, but uh, we didn't have a good experience because um, uh, there are the, there are two different uh, crops and the different requirements, and that we saw as the coffee, uh, for coffee farmers uh, weren't in, enough um, ready to 
management two crops, two crops in the same at the same time. So uh, they um, uh, the, the the production of the coffee low because they uh, was more focusing in the cacao, and the it's no it wasn't a, the, the good solution for us. Okay, uh, great. So, um, so I guess the answer is that the crop differences can be enough to really um, justify or require <laughs> uh, different types of services. Uh, I suppose they each have different um, pest problems and different um, fertilization requirements. Um, okay. Um, uh, Andrea, did you want to uh, weigh in on this issue or uh, or should we go to the next one? Yeah, no, I can think we go to another topic. I see some other questions there. Thank you. Yes, there are quite a few. <laughs> um, okay, one of the other questions was about, this is from uh, Victoria Mancia, uh, and she asks um, about the skills required to use these apps, to use these digital services and whether you see a difference in um, the ability of people to, um, you know, to learn how to use these. I think Nestor has already talked about younger people. Uh, I know I'm asking my son for <laughs> help on various technical things sometimes. Um, uh, are there differences by age or by gender or by education in terms of ability to uh, take advantage of these new technologies? And um, have you had any experience in trying to address these differences to, to, to make it inclusive so that, uh, so that everyone uh, or as many people as possible are able to uh, make use of them? Um, should we start with uh, Jenny? Do you want to comment on that or? No, go to Andrea. I'd like to, to hear her. Okay. Too. Sure. Andrea? sure, thank you. So yeah, this, this is actually a very good question. As practitioners and designers for, for a while, maybe for 10 years or more, we intended to design everything ourselves and push the services out no? and see who can use it. And we were designing from our perspective. We were not thinking that much about the user. So now that we are, that we understood that that's a need, um, we also need to think What's the main objective? Are we pushing everyone to the same level of skill? So we want everyone to be super skilled to do this and that not, without taking care of, you know, who they are, what are their cultural background, what's the cultural knowledge that they bring in. So um, I think there is kind of a two way approach where you have to like meet in the in between. So on the one hand, you have to bring everyone up to some basic level of digital skills. So to use a mobile phone, to download an app, to know how to, you know, criteria to search um, in Google, for instance. So those are the basic skills that we would like everyone to have, but also we need to understand who that user is, no? So do they have access to mobile phone? Do they make decisions within the household? Do they know how to read? Are they going to learn how to read to be able to use an app? Not necessarily, right? And we still want to help them in some way related to the digital innovation. So in that other way, we also want to design based on those needs to understand how we can meet their actual skills from the design perspective, but also if we need additional training, additional skills that also needs to come in. So yeah, there is different, different users, but as it is as you find different users in whatever product or service that you that you have. So you need to think about the user. Uh, great. Thanks, Andrea. Uh, Nestor, did you want to, uh, you had already mentioned the difference between by age. Uh, do you see other, um, you know, differences in ability to make use of these technologies uh, between men and women by education or uh, things like that? Uh, yeah, by education, I think I very I, there are differences, uh, but uh, I think the, the younger people is more friendly to use the technology. Uh, in fact, we use uh, youngs to collect information in the, the field. Um, there's easier for them 
to use the new applications or formats or other uh, tools we are using. Um, I think there is not a difference between gender. I think women and men have the, the same capacity to capacity to to collect information and management information and and make um, analyze with well criteria in the data they collect. Okay, great. Um, okay, we have a question from uh, Federico Ceballos from um, the Alliance for Biodiversity and SIAT. Um, he's, uh, I guess, is mainly asking, uh, oh, well, okay, it's been labeled as answered, but I, I think there's still some, some information um, that we could uh, address here. Um, the, uh, there are already uh, some digital solutions that are being developed by uh, by farmers on their own. And I'm thinking he's thinking of um, WhatsApp groups uh, for exchanging information about uh, prices or production methods and things like that. Um, so um, are you at CIMET or at the Instituto, uh, you know, uh, harnessing these existing solutions? Are you able to build on these in any way to, um, you know, given that they already exist and they are sort of um, already in practice, is, are there ways that you can develop them further um, in, uh, in your work? Um, I'm looking for volunteers. I don't yes, see I can go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> okay, go ahead. Yeah, absolutely. That's also something we have been more aware in the last years. Um, and it's the fact that digitalization, it's very organic now. So it's not us only pushing for one thing again, but just it's happening organically among um, the community. So first thing, when, when, when we say about the final user thinking and designing for the final user, first thing we do is kind of set up the scene, understanding how are they relating to digital technologies. And many, many, many times we have lear learned and understood that they already use WhatsApp. So we use those WhatsApp communities and we just create, for instance, podcasts, the ones that I was mentioning before, there are very short um, audio messages that we deliver through their WhatsApp um, group. So what we help them with is to create content that is related to their needs, answering their questions, but maybe content that is easily um, addressed and accessed and maybe also to trying to think about the languages that you need the content and the type of communication that you do. So working on the content is one thing that we have done several times to connect to whatever is existing already in the communities. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, okay, um, there's uh, another question here from um, Alejandro Solis. Um, this is actually a question I'm surprised it didn't, it didn't come up uh, first thing. Um, given the explosion of interest and visibility of AI, um, uh, does that, uh, um, is anyone working on uh, incorporating AI into, um, into these uh, digital tools to, to help farmers or to connect farmers with, uh, with buyers? Um, you know, for example, uh, let's say an AI bot uh, that provides recommendations based on, um, I don't know, a photo of a plant or uh, a question from a farmer. Is that, uh, is that something that uh, that's being worked on? Uh, there, I, I don't remember a mention of that, but maybe, I'm, maybe I missed it. Yeah, I think that's an interesting question. And Alejandro, thank you. Um, in this, this mapping was focused more in digital product services and products. So, because we, we, we as a users and farmers, they relate to digital products and services. They, don't, they do not connect directly, you know, with blockchain and machine learning of artificial intelligence. So what, what we found in this mapping is that some of these products and services use artificial intelligence or machine learning or other kind of of technologies, so I I I will say yes uh, at at some degree and at, at some extent of complexity it's it's being used, uh, but I think that's uh, another of the elements that we need to understand better in the future is how all these new technologies they combine 
and they form and they um, they fit these new products and services. So uh, short question, yes, I mean, it's present and it's, it's present across different different products in different degrees. Mm -hmm. uh, and I but just want oh, to go ahead, Andre. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to add to that, that for that particular service on the chatbot that I imagine everyone has in mind, the chat GPT option, uh, we have been doing research recently to understand what's, you know, you know, all the AI models, chatbot type models have a bias, depending on the data that they have been trained on, the bias is different. So what we're doing is some research to understand what would be the bias of these open and public services, for instance, for smallholder farmers and me, and also for gender. So what we're doing now, and we have been finding solid evidence that there is a bias, there is a bias towards uh, large scale farmers. So because there is a lot more research related to large scale when it comes to digitalization rather than smallholders, that's one. Mm -hmm. And the other one is gender. So we have found that um, many of the recommendations come from research that is um, gender biased already. So the results of these chatbots are already biased. So yeah, we're a bit concerned about that and we are trying to learn more about how what's our position about that and should we recommend that to farmers or not mm -hmm. right. and i would think there would also be a challenge uh you know in order to train these ai systems you need thousands or you know tens of thousands of of, of photos of you know uh coffee leaf rust or something like that in order to uh help it understand what is and what isn't uh you know, a symptom of, of the disease. Um, and sometimes, I don't know if the, that, that those training photos are, are available. Um, okay, let, uh, we are just about running out of time, but uh, let me just maybe ask one more question, one last question, because um, multiple people asked about this, so, um, uh, so it must be important. <laughs> um, that's about um, blockchain and the potential of blockchain to um, uh, sort of uh, uh, document uh, or, or provide traceability to know, uh, you know where uh, a particular batch of coffee or uh, cocoa was, was produced. Um, so um, is there any work using blockchain to uh, implement uh, traceability? I yeah, I'd be like to say yes. Um, in some of the cases that we identify, and you can see in the mapping, for example, in a trace uh, that is being unfolded by the uh, the German cooperation, you know, in partnership with different actors, they, that it's one of the you know it seems it's, it's still in pilot and in development, but they um, they are hoping to facilitate this traceability. Uh, so yes, I think different actors are using blockchain, but they are using it in a different way. Some actors want to have this, like to create this and share it as an open source, but other companies say, I build this, but it's a patent behind this. So the business model is different. So it's emerging, it's happening very organically and very rapidly, but we still need to know more if the promise of this traceability, I mean, is for whom, who is going to benefit the most and who is going to take the most time to feed this, this system and how, and, and how is going, and I mean, because we talk about the traceability because it's important, but mm -hmm. I think we, we need to uh, think further in about traceability for, for whom, who is going to benefit of all the changes and all the hard work that, that has to be put in place so this system work. Um, so that's something that we need to uh, to explore because there are a flourishing of different platforms, not only in Central America, but in different parts of the world uh, based on blockchain. Okay. Um, uh, thank you, Jenny. Uh, um, uh, any uh, additional comments, Nestor or Andrea on uh, blockchain? Yeah. I guess, um, is it feasible? Does it make sense? <laughs> Yeah, we have a, a lot of um, examples of using uh, cooperatives using own blockchain in Honduras, but I think um, there's no problem just for stakeholders, regardless there are small, medium, or large uh, stakeholders. I think there's a problem too for um, adoption in the institutions, like us, our institutions, 
because the um, maker decisions, uh, they are not familiarized with this kind of uh, um, technology. And we, ha we, we have to work with them to make the best decisions to incorporate this uh, kind of technology like blockchain in the transactions and the trustability systems in, in the and all the sector in Honduras. Uh, so we have a lot of work in this in this topic. Great, thanks, Nasser. Uh, Andrea, any final comments? Be the last word. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I completely agree. I mean, the technology itself has been proven to work. So blockchain is solid as a decentralized technology, but institutionally, you know, at the local levels, we're not ready skills but also in terms of understanding and the processes that we have do not fit really well into what has been done in other parts of the globe so it's a matter of bringing again these two together to see how we can actually deploy blockchain in the context in context like ours with the mm -hmm. institutions and the mindset that we have <laughs> okay and i guess you need some willingness to pay for that traceability some premium that you can get if you can show exactly where this product came from and yes. you know to cover the cost of this extra technology and you need you need the enabling environment and the enabling mm -hmm. environment is not always there to to show people so to convince people to get into to get on board you need the enabling environment already and that's not because it's all very new that's not there yet so yeah it's complicated to to okay. bring people on well i have a feeling we could uh talk about these topics for another um <laughs> hour or two but uh let me we're a little bit over schedule you know uh, uh, late in, in ending. So let me uh, 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 close the discussion now. Um, thank you very much, Jenny, for, for the presentation. And thank you to our um, excellent discussants, Nestor and Andrea. Uh, very, very interesting discussion. Uh, and as I say, a lot more that could be said, but I think we've covered a lot of grounds. Uh, before I uh, leave, let me just remind everyone that one, the video of this will be available on the KISM uh, website. And two, if you need additional information, the chat uh, box includes links to uh, the Rethinking Markets Initiative, to uh, KISM, uh, and various other resources that you might find useful for, for getting more information. Uh, and with that, uh, let me uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us today and making this a very uh, insightful discussion. Um, and um, we welcome your comments and questions. Uh, there's also a, a discussion forum. Uh, if you have additional questions or want to continue the discussion, there's a link in the chat box for continuing the, the discussion, the topic on uh, digital tools for agriculture. Um, and um, so we look forward to continuing this conversation. So thank you, everyone, and uh, until the next webinar. Take care, everyone.